Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, today we're going to be talking about immutable infrastructure uh, with this idea of shifting left. Uh, and it's part of something that we've been doing quite a bit where we're rethinking configuration in the age of easy redeployment, meaning with cloud, we've really made it possible to create and destroy infrastructure. Uh, containers are even faster at this. And with RackN, what we've been working to do is do that for physical. So you can actually look at a, a system where no infrastructure that you've deployed is permanent. Right? The physical machine might still be permanent, but your configuration is easy to tear down and reset, just like reprovisioning VMs in the cloud or reprovisioning containers in Docker. And, and that really changes the way we think about it. It's something we call immutable infrastructure, and the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to dive deeply into doing that. Uh, I am a co-founder of a company called RackN, uh, and we are all about automating infrastructure. We've been doing it for quite a while at the physical level. Um, and I've been involved in cloud, cloud infrastructure, containerized world for quite some time. I was on the board at OpenStack and one of the founders of the board involved for a long time there um, and in virtualization for much longer than that. Uh, I've been involved in the Kubernetes project for a long time too. And, and Racken itself has been going as a three and a half year old startup. Uh, building this automated infrastructure. Uh, but before that, we were doing uh, the same thing at Dell, doing a project called Crowbar, where we were trying to design and deploy uh, systems in a completely repeatable way. And the first use case we hit with that was always, can you reprovision my machines? Can you reset them up? And that was a, an important pattern that we've, we've really been embracing for, for many, many years now. And this presentation comes out of uh, a goal that we had for KubeCon in November of 2017 in Austin, uh, which was to be able to wheel out a rack, uh, turn it on, and have Kubernetes magically appear. Uh, a completely self-bootstrapping cluster. Uh, this was something that uh, we had discussed with uh, Kelsey Hightower. Didn't turn out to be the keynote that he chose, but it was something we actually built all the technology to do. Um, and, and it's it's pretty cool. So literally you can boot machines with in-memory operating systems, install Docker or elect a leader, use kube admin, which is the community installer to um, install on that leader and then pass tokens around to the kube admin. So the whole system, uh, we have some videos about it, completely automated, Kubernetes, you turn on the systems, Kubernetes gets installed. But it was, it's been hard to maintain that system because any change in Docker, in Kubernetes, and Kube Admin breaks it. It's, it's not the process that fails. That's easy and very reliable. It's the dependencies that are changing. Uh, and that's just the reality of life. They are constantly changing. And so we really wanted to say, how do we take this very cool demo that you can implement in Digital Rebar yourself? Check out this video. Um, it's something that we have in the community, and, and people do uh, use this as a training exercise for Digital Rebar, uh, which is the open source project that Racken maintains for provisioning. Uh, and you can use it on VMs or cloud resources, pretty straightforward stuff. But when we look back at it, it wasn't immutable the way we really wanted things to be immutable, um, because it was still doing a lot of configuration dynamically on the fly. And so Let's look at this more carefully, right? Why is configuration so fragile? And it's fragile because it's about mutation even more than configuration. What we mean is we're taking a system when we configure it and we're changing it. And that ends up creating a lot of complexity. So while we really love infrastructure as code, uh, which means using you know, a configuration system, writing code that does your deployment and pulls everything together, it ends up being a lot of mutation, and mutation adds complexity, especially over time, right? We can build in place a system, but we have hidden dependency graphs. Did Docker change? Did the library change? Did part of that, that end thing I'm trying to install have components that had to be uh, fixed and pulled down and downloaded, and did those get moved, right? Our whole uh, install process broke for Ubuntu because Ubuntu, one of the mirrors we use, stopped supporting uh, a recent ISO. And that broke the builds. And it's normal. It's, it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way dependency graphs are. And it's very hard to lock things down. You could clone the internet. Um, but that becomes a really never-ending um, uh, 
wheel of, of change. It's very hard to keep up with. And it's even worse if you look at patches and updates. So if you take live systems and try to keep them updated, you have item potency, which is very hard, where you want to keep applying, this, take the same steps, get the same results. But over time, that becomes harder and harder, and we get drift. We can't move backwards. It's very hard to unconfigure a system. Uh, and all those things combine to make it very indeterminate. What we'd like to be able to do is lock those systems down. Be able to say, you know what, we don't want all these moving parts. We don't want a lot of small configuration steps. We'd rather just take a single artifact and deliver that whole working artifact because that would eliminate the dependency graph problem. It would all the item potency, configuration, stacked changes, all should go away. And that brings us to this immutable infrastructure. So the glue analogy is really good. We're trying to lock everything together so that it's not immutable. And it's really not immutable, if you don't like that word. Think of it as pre-deploy configured. So what we're trying to do is not make things unchanged. What we're really trying to do is say, look, let's do our configuration before deployment. That might sound crazy if you're used to traditional deployments, which look like this. What we're saying is the system normally, traditionally, has been configured in situ, so in production. So the configure step over here on the right, the green one, is done after you deploy a system. You do a whole bunch of configuration, and then you can run it. And we'll talk about how that can be immutable-like, uh, but it, there's, two, there's a couple of flavors here, and I want to go through all of them. What we're saying here is there's a configuration before deployment. So ideally, before we... we deploy something, we actually do all of the configuration. That means installing the system, getting its dependencies, doing its configuration, like all of the passwords and codes and secrets and everything like that should be built in and then shipped as a unit. And that sounds really cool until you start doing the math on how many different uh, images you'd have to deploy and track and things like that. It gets to be a little bit crazy to think every server would have a unique custom image and anytime it changes you'd create a new custom image for that server. That's an end by end problem. It's very hard. Uh, so instead, the pattern is really configure as much as you can before deployment, but then initialize. So uh, the pattern we usually see with this is like cloud init um, or some type of last second you know, configuration injection. And we don't keep in initializing. It's just beginning. And so from that perspective, we have the system coming up to speed in a very consistent way. So we, we have this sort of pipeline, code, build, integrate, configure. We build our system, we deploy it, we do some minimal initialization, and then we can run it. And that scales very nicely because that way each system can have slightly different personalities. You don't have to worry about having one per node. You can have a class of systems and just initialize those systems. If you really want to dig deeper into where this goes, I recommend a book called Cloud Native Infrastructure by Justin Garrison and Chris Nova. Uh, they take this even further in, the, in their book, and what they really say is that if you have this type of system, you can put a state manager around it and take that immutable block and let the state manager deal with all the configuration and placement and running and, and all that. It's huge. It's, it's a really big concept enabled by having these immutable building blocks with predictable initialization sequences. And that is what Kubernetes does. And this isn't really Kubernetes talk. Kubernetes leverages these principles, but immutable is bigger than what Kubernetes is. We think that the, the process and the things that you're learning with immutable can be applied in a much more general way than just in Kubernetes because immutability is a DevOps pattern where we're, we're trying to do is shift left, so do more work pre-production earlier in our pipelines and leverage this create-delete pattern where we, instead of assuming that we have to con reconfigure, we can destroy our, configure our systems and then rebuild them. So let's take a look at how that is and then st and step us through the, the packaging. Here's traditionally what we see, right? We, we package everything for our server image, we provision the server, we configure it, and then we run it. And then something comes along and we have to patch. So we don't want to, we don't go through the whole process again traditionally, we just do a patch, then we do another patch. And at this point, the system is getting to be in some intermediate state. It's very hard to sustain this as you get more and more patches, which means that we really end up with the snowflake. And the madness gets out of hand very quickly, right? We have to maintain root access on the system, which isn't as secure because we have to be able to patch it. We have to know what the system is that we're patching. It's very hard to 
sort of just assume that all the patches work. We have to understand that the dependency graph is there so we can bring in the things the patch needs um, and that we actually understand the whole graph when we apply the patch. And then you have weird coordination problems like, all right, I'm patching a system. Do I drain it from work? Do I pull it offline? Is it running? Is it not running? Is it communicating? You have to do a lot of things during that patch process to actually make sure that you're not creating a corrupted state. And with all that going on, drift is inevitable. So we start having nodes that don't aren't what we think they are. And as, when we go to patch them, they end up looking sort of weird. And that makes us really sad. So this pattern, which is incredibly common, most, most people, most operators I know deal with it, um, they, they are sad because it, it just ends up being a lot of work. Systems are never what they think. So instead, what we want to do is take this, this idea and shift it to the left. So we want to say, you know what, we're never going to patch. We want to destroy this system and then start over. So the patch is applied at the beginning. This is where the shift left comes from, the beginning of this process or earlier in this process. So I patch my server image, then I provision, then I do my initial configuration, and then I destroy. And I get into this cycle where every patch that gets applied, every change that gets applied, so it's not just patching my own software, it's patching the operating system, it's the dependencies, it's the graph, it's all the pieces and parts I need. Any one of those changes I put through the whole pipeline. And so that ends up looking like this staged build environment. Um, you might be thinking, wow, that is a lot of bits to push around. If I have to make one code line change, do I really want to push a whole package through the system? You do. It's not as much overhead as you might think to transfer that, and the, the results of having a predictable system is very large. So you want this type of batch system, even though there's small changes going through, they end up being predictable changes. And if that one small change breaks you, which is likely, right, any one change could break you in a very bad way, you can just roll backwards to the previous iteration as a unit, and you're not worried about trying to back out one line of change or one piece of code through your system. You can just roll the whole image back. Very powerful concept, especially if you start thinking about like AB or blue-green deployments. Ultimately, what we're describing here is cloud-like behavior. So it's really looking at how we want systems to behave in a cloud-like way, and I mean cloud very generically, not VMs and Amazon. Um, clouds have this tendency to have an API-driven design where you request a state, you return a state. Uh, so very black box, um, sort of like the CNI concepts we were discussing before. Uh, and we really want to treat the systems as a black box. Inside that black box, of course, there's a lot of things going on. Um, you're you know, resetting, installing, configuring, testing, joining to clusters. There, there is work that has to be done um, to make sure this is going on. But it's sort of an interesting blend. Uh, at one level in the supply, in the chain, you get to have a black box abstracted system, but then inside under the covers do you have a whole bunch of gears turning and things like that. Gears turning can be dangerous. We don't want hidden operations. So if you have a system that does this, which is what we're recommending, you need to make sure that inside that box, box we have very transparent repeatable operations with stages and controls and things like that. So don't assume that just because my build system is going to give me an image and it's going to get magically deployed that I can ignore the operational system that does that work. It's incredibly important for it to be very transparent and operate in a clean way. You just find that developers might not care about that abstraction boundary and that's that's the whole that's the beauty of having abstraction boundaries. That's why cloud works. Wow. So Thank you for hanging with us. We've gotten all the way through immutability, sort of what the concept is, how they work. Now we get to talk some patterns. So we see three primary patterns for immutability. Uh, the first one is this baseline configuration. So remember I had said, if you're doing traditional configuration uh, booting, this is, you can, you're, you can do this style of work. It's exactly what we did for our demo, where we continually booted and refresh the system. Uh, and it's pretty easy to achieve with current Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt uh, types of work uh, where you're literally taking the system through its stages. So you have a base, you, you provision it, you baseline it, you configure it, you run it, and instead of patching, you reset the environment all the way back. Um, this eliminates the patching burden uh, 
it still has a lot of post configuration. You're still relying on the dependency graph. It's not really immutable um, because you're, you're depending on your configuration system to operate in a consistent, reliable way. Uh, and this is a little bit slow because you've got to provision a baseline and then you've got to do the configuration. Um, but it is a much more hygienic way to operate your system with a lot more turnover so you're not leaving um, environments around that might be collecting drift or collecting uh, malware or something like that, especially if you start putting them through. You could even in this model remove uh, privileged access from your systems post configuration because you're never going to have to go back. The, the corrective state is to just reset. If you want to take this a, a step further, our second pattern comes in where instead of actually installing an operating system permanently, you do live boot. So in, li in a live boot model, it's, it's very, very similar, but instead of having to reset the environment, you just reboot it operating system is destroyed and then you boot provision the operating system. So core OS, container Linux, Atomic, um, Rancher OS all follow the same pattern. Um, it's very fast for resetting. Uh, it does force good behavior because you know the systems are going to be constantly being reset. But provisioning is now a critical path. So you're going to have to consider what would happen if my DHCP boot provisioner is not gone. And you're still and you're still dealing with the dependency graph. So this is where in our Kubernetes demo, which we call crib, Kubernetes rebar immutable boot, um, in, that, in that case, you still have to resolve the dependency graph. You're still pulling down Docker, you're still installing it, you're still dealing with the uh, kube admin and, and getting it and all the containers it needs from the internet. Uh, so there's, there's still risk. Um, in, in this type of model, but it's, it's pretty clean. It's, a lot of people like it. It's, it's a fast, easy way to make sure that you're constantly turning over your systems. Image deploy is what I would consider real immutability, um, because in this case, you've actually shifted configuration across the deployment line. You're doing much more of your configuration during your build process, and then you're deploying build artifacts. Uh, and the benefit here is that it's much faster to deploy. Uh, we have some demos about this. I, I strongly recommend you look it up. Basically, uh, we will boot into a in-memory operating system, very lightweight, uh, when we call Sledgehammer. And from Sledgehammer, you can start a work queue that downloads an image and, and copies it directly to disk, uh, and then boots the machine with that disk. Uh, it's five times faster in the clocking that we've been doing of traditional netboot install type processes. And since it's immutable, the amount of configuration that you have to do is, is minimal. So you're not dragging down a dependency graph, you're counting on your build system to do that. Uh, and in those cases, you really go provision, deploy, run, provision, deploy, run, uh, and you're constantly able to re-up the system. Uh, so very powerful. If you actually write the image to disk, you don't have the risk of your DHCP system failing because you could, you're always going to boot back to disk. Um, it'd be possible to combine these two, the, the in-memory boot. You're going to end up putting a lot of things in that in-memory boot. Um, and that, but that's a, another practical option that we, we didn't lay out here because we really see image deploy as a, as a key thing. One of the things to remember here is that in those images, you still have to put some type of agent you have to inject something that handles that initialization. So you're not just taking the artifact. Initialization is an important part of the process. And so you need some type of post provision initialization agent um, that can be injected into the image deploy process. So I could actually have been on either image deploy or run. It's pretty cool. And so if you're thinking about this, the first thing that's probably coming to your mind is, wow, how do I create that image? Um, and because you still have to do the configuration, there's no free lunch, right? You're in the, your build pipeline, you're going to have to boot a machine, you're going to have to do the configuration, then you're going to have to rip a image from that configuration so that you can save it. Uh, some popular tools, HashiCorp Packer seems to be one of the top, the top, there's something called Image Builder out of the OpenStack community, uh, Windows has their own. Uh, basically, these are these are images that are in a format that can be transferred around. So uh, for Amazon, it would be an AMI or a virtual machine, a VHD, OVS, um, or for hard to, for physical machines, you're passing around raw images. These are highly compressed, uh, so they're they're actually pretty small. And if you think about it, uh, if I was going to do a traditional install, I still have to drag all that stuff across. In a lot of cases, maybe even more because I'm doing an app get install or a Windows update. Um, and those are slow. If you've already done it once and then just distribute the image, you've saved a lot of time. It's 
It's a very powerful concept here. Um, and so, you know, it is work to make this happen. It, it, you know, you're going to have to think through what it takes to build. You might want to just start with models one and two, where it's just configuration in the field, but done more often. But once you get this done, um, you'll find it's very powerful to be able to translate your image between different environments. So now you, even though you have a little bit more build pipeline work, it's faster in deployment. It's safer because you actually know exactly what it is. You can take that image and test it in multiple locations, and it's much more scalable, right? You, you are not trying to figure out what each machine is. Every, every server stops being a snowflake, and they start being much more um, reasonable facsimiles of the systems that they were, right? Think clones rather than each one having its own sort of lifespan. And that's an important transition uh, for an ops team as you grow and become more scalable. It also makes things more portable because now you're not depending on internet connectivity and what's on your local environment to configure the system. Uh, you've really streamlined that process also. So lots of wins from this type of a pattern. We hope that this has been helpful. If you're interested in immutable metal, that's what Racken does. Um, We've built uh, digital rebar and a whole bunch of infrastructure around it to help you make this process super easy. And so we're finding uh, people can get up to speed in digital rebar um, in an hour, fully trained, pretty competent in a, in a half day, um, and then very quickly up to speed on uh, some of these immutable concepts around Kubernetes or image deployments. Those are things that Racken can really help you work with. So please uh, check out portal.racken.io and it'll walk you through uh, an install. And while we have a SaaS component, it's always worth noting this is an on-premises solution for running a data center. It sits behind your firewall and is completely secure and air-gapped and does all these things that are they're exactly what you'd want in a you know, bare metal provisioning infrastructure. Um, and of course, everything we're talking about is generally applicable too. It's what you would do in the cloud. You take the same process, you deploy VMs the same way, and if you think about how you're using containers, containers have exactly the same process in them too. So if this is interesting, please let us know. Um, we always like feedback um, about our talks, about our material, and especially um, in our community around what we're trying to do with uh, data center automation. Thanks very much.